There are birds here by Jamal Mann. Icy fields, is water flowing in the tank? Will they huddle together when bodies pressing? Is it the year of the goat or the sheep? Scholars debating Chinese zodiac, follower or leader, they'll lead them to a warm corner. Little ones toward bulkier bodies, lead them to the brush which cuts the icy wind. Another's, another's. Another frigid night swooping down. Aren't you worried about them? I asked my friend, who lives by herself far from here near the town of Ozona. She shrugs. Not really. They know what to do. They're goats. Steel by Joseph Birchhoff. Steel arches up past the customs sheds. The bridge to a place named Canada. A dull rainbow. Arching 
over the new school. Designed to fan out like the tail of the drumming partridge, dark feathers of the old way's pride, mixed with blessed Qataris, pale dreams of sacred water. When that first span fell in 1907, cantilevered shapes collapsed, gave like an old man's arthritic back. The tide was out. The injured lay trapped like game in a deadfall throughout, through, all through the day. Until the evening. Then, as the tide came in, the priest crawled through the wreckage and gave last rites to the drowning. Loading on, the cable lift. Girders swing, swinging and singing in the sun, tacked to the sky, reflecting the wind. Long knife blade mirrors fall like jack's straws when they hit the top of the boom's run. The cable loops, the buzzer man presses a button red as sunset, the mosquito whir of the motors, whirs bare bones up to the men who stand an edge defined on either side by a long way down. Those who hold papers claim to have ownership over land and buildings. They do not see the hands that placed each rivet. They do not hear the feet walking on each hidden beam. They do not hear the whisper of strong clan names. They do not see the faces of those who remain, unseen as those girders that shape and support. Respectability by Tina Boyer Brown.
We ask our children to act calm, nervous, whatever innocent looks like when some cop shows his badge, pulls his gun, slows his car. We beg kids to say soft yes sirs. We beg kids to get on the roof of that car, empty their pockets, shut up, put your hands behind your head. No is an existential threat. 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 Never is an existential threat. Never is an existential threat. Never is an existential threat. We, we dare ask for humility in the face of this oppression. We have no idea what the threat feels like, but we know Brianna, Rakia, Sandra, Nia, Betty, Yvette, Miram, Sharice, Ahmad, Trayvon, Eric, Laquan, Michael, Philando, Stefan, Alton, Quintonio, Ramai, George, Jordan, Jonathan, Samuel, Tamir, and more and more and more. There's no open risk declaring our innocence where peace confers. Our kids stand in front of doors, pages, words in the streets. They shut down, they shut down, they shut down. The frames burning against them. Resignation Letter by Jean Dubro. You remember the mermaid makes a deal, her tongue evicted from her throat, and moving is a knife cut with every step. This is what it means to be free from water. Dear colleagues, you write, for weeks I've been typing this letter in the bright kingdom of my imagination. Your body is a ship of pain, Pleasure is when you climb rocks and watch the moonlight touching everywhere you want to go. A silver world called far away. Dear colleagues, you write, here is a few sentences contained by the cursor's rippling barriers. <sighs> what happened here is only beaks and brackets the Ceres liquid stroke. The old story has witches, a prince in love with the surging silence of women. The knife turns the water red. You write, dear colleagues, these years are filed into the infinite oceans of bureaucracy. Everything bleaches or fades. In other words, goodbye. Creatures like you deserve to go in a spray of salt, green droplets floating breathlessly in the air. Another anti-pastoral by V.V. Francis. I want to put down what the mountain has awakened. My mouth full of grass. My curious tail. I want to stand still but find myself moved patch by patch. There's a bleat in my throat. Words fail me here. Can you understand? I sink to my knees, tired or not. I now know the ragweed from the goldenrod and the blinding beauty of green. Don't you see? 
I am shedding my skins. I am a paper hive, a wolf spider, the creeping ivy, the ache of a birch, a heifer, a doe. I have fallen from my dream of progress, the clear-cut glass, the potted and balconied tree, the lemon wax wood over a marbled pillar into my own nocturne. The lullabies I have forgotten. How could I have known what slept inside? What would rend my fantasies to cud and up from this belly's wet straw-strewn field? After working 60 hours again, for what reason, by Bob Hickok. The best job I had was moving a stone from one side of the road to the other. This required a permit, which required a bribe. The bribe took all my salary, yet because I hadn't finished the job, I had no salary. And to pay the bribe, I took a job moving the stone the other way. Because the official wanted his bribe, he gave me a permit for the second job. When I pointed out that the work would be best completed if I did nothing, he complimented my brain and wrote a letter to my employer suggesting promotion on stationery, bearing the wings of a raptor spread in flight over a mountain 
smaller than the bird. My boss, fearing my intelligence, paid me to sleep on the sofa and take lunch with the official who required a bribe to keep anything from being done. When I told my parents, they wrote my brother to come home from university to be slapped on the back of the head. Dutifully, he arrived and bowed to receive instruction, at which point sense entered his body, and he asked me what I could do by way of a job. I pointed out there were stones everywhere trying not to move, and all it took was a little gumption to be the man who didn't move them. It was hard to explain the intricacies of not obtaining a permit to not do this. Just yesterday, he got up at dawn and shaved, as if the lack of hair on his face had anything to do with the appearance of food on an empty table. Thank you. by Harriet Mullen. We are not responsible for your lost or stolen relatives. We cannot guarantee your safety if you disobey our instructions. We do not endorse the causes or claims of people begging for handouts. We reserve the right to refuse service to anyone. Your ticket does not guarantee that we will honor your reservations. In order to facilitate our procedures, please limit your carrying on. Before taking off, please extinguish all smoldering resentments. If you cannot understand English, you will be moved out the way. In the event of a loss, you'd better look out for yourself. Your insurance was canceled because we can no longer handle your frightful claims. Our handlers lost your luggage and we are unable to find the key to your legal case. You were detained for interrogation because you fit the profile. You are not presumed to be innocent if the police have reason to suspect you are carrying a concealed wallet. It's not our fault you were born wearing a gang color. It's not our obligation to inform you of your rights. Step aside, please, while our officer inspects your bad attitude. You have no rights we are bound to respect. Please remain calm or we can't be held responsible for what happens to you. in the Rain by Richard Blanco. Someday, compassion would demand I set myself free of my desire to recreate my father, indulge in my mother's losses, strangle lovers with words, forcing them to confess for me and take the blame. Today was that day. I tossed them sheet by sheet on the patio and gathered them into a pyre. I wanted to let them go in a blaze. <laughs> let them go burst like winged seeds beside the azaleas and ficus bushes, a thousand gray butterflies in the wind. Today was that day, but it rained. It kept raining. Instead of fire, water, drops knocking on doors, wetting windows, reflecting me in the oaks, the garden walls and stones, swelling into ghostlier shades themselves, the wind chimes giggling, and the storm a coffee cup left overflowing with rain. Instead of burning, my pages turned into water lilies floating over puddles, then tiny white cliffs as the sun set, finally drying all night under the moon into paper mache souvenirs. The rain would not let their lives burn today.
Advice to a Prophet by Richard Wilbur. When you come, as you soon must, to the streets of our city, mad-eyed from stating the obvious, not proclaiming our fall, but begging us in God's name to have self-pity. Spare us all word of the weapons, their force and range, the long numbers that rocket the mind, our slow, unreckoning hearts will be left behind, unable to fear what is too strange. Nor shall you scare us with talk of the death of the race. How should we dream of this place without us? The sun mere fire, the leaves untroubled about us, a stone look on the stone's face? Speak of the world's own change. Though we cannot conceive of an undreamt thing, we know to our cost how the dreamt cloud crumbles. The vines are blackened by frost. How the view alters. We could believe if you told us so that the white-tailed deer will slip into perfect shade, grown perfectly shy. The lark avoid the reaches of our eye. The jack pine lose its knuckled grip on the cold ledge, and every torrent burn as Xanthus once. It's gliding trout, stunned in a twinkle. What should we be without the dolphin's ark? The doves return, these things in which we have seen ourselves and spoken, ask us, prophet, how we shall call our natures forth when that live tongue is all dispelled, that glass obscured or broken, in which we have said the rose of our love and the clean horse of our courage, in which beheld the singing locust of the soul unshelled and all we need or wish to. Ask us, ask us whether with the world this rose our heart shall fail us. Come demanding whether there shall be lofty or long standing when the bronze annals of the oak tree close.